Well, we are in a study. We have been throughout this year through the book of Revelation. We, we spent the first part of the year together just looking at the first five chapters with this theme and this focus of Jesus' love for his church. And after the summer, we began a study through what's known as the tribulation and the great tribulation period, chapters 6 through 19. And we're at an interesting and illuminating point in our study of the book of Revelation. I mean, let me just remind you of what we saw in chapter 13 just a few weeks ago. Chapter 13, we see spiritual darkness almost at the... Gosh, I would say at the zenith of its power. Look at verse 3. We'll put it up on the screen. This is how the time is described in what's yet to come. The whole world gave allegiance to the beast. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped him. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who's able to fight against him? And we're told in verse 7 that the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. That he's given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. We're at a very illuminating, interesting point in our study of this book. We see, specifically in that chapter, that the enemy, it's like he's showing all of his cards, allowing the full force of his evil intentions and desire to be supreme and to rule and to reign comes to complete fruition. Chapter 14, though, is a little bit like a breath of fresh air. John, the author of the book of Revelation, is kind of in a vision taken to the very end of the tribulation, that time of the millennial reign of Jesus, and he's given a vision of Jesus, who's called often throughout this book as the Lamb. And he sees in this vision that, that the beast, the dragon, the Antichrist is not the ultimate victor, but that Jesus is. And he reminds God's people of the surety they have in the salvation of God, the gospel of God, the judgment of God, that God will come and judge injustice. And last week, chapters 15 and 16, chapter 15 starts this way, that there's an, a marvelous event here of great significance, that, that the last seven plagues that were poured out that we saw in chapter 16, well, they complete God's wrath. The world, which is overripe for judgment, the beast, the Antichrist, will experience the just judgment of God. And where we left off last week is like the world is now primed for that final battle, that battle of Armageddon. And after this morning, we have three more studies in this book before we kind of turn our focus to the holidays. We'll cover chapters 17 through 19 in, in the next few weeks. And then when we get back together in the month of January, we'll begin looking at chapters 20 through 22, where we will see that Jesus wins. Let me give you a preview. Chapter 22, verse 3. No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face. His name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and he and they will reign forever and ever. That's good news, wouldn't you say? Like that's the end of the book. But here's the thing. Because we covered not one, but two chapters last week, we kind of have an opportunity this morning to discuss something that I believe is of great importance to our lives presently, presently in this church age. It's something that relates to what we've been studying the last couple of weeks as we've been considering the enemy at the zenith of his power and that just judgment that is coming that is in Revelation 
we see the enemy's engagement, his involvement on earth in the lives of the people of God at a time that is to come where he is going to reveal all of his cards. It seems like the whole world is worshiping him. But then as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, God's just judgment will come. So here's the question I want to ask. What does his engagement, what does his involvement look like now for us as the church in the 21st century? We see what is to come, that it's going to get darker before Jesus finally, in his grace and in his mercy, finally brings the just judgment that's deserved. But what about now? What's life look like for us as believers who are not in this time of the great tribulation? You see, this morning, we'll be discussing a little bit of the topic of spiritual warfare. Much can be said about this theme throughout Scripture. In fact, we took the last couple of days with some men from the church went to Blue Lake in Andalusia, Alabama, and had a theme of focus that the battle belongs to the Lord, in which we were given some phenomenal teachings. You know how I, why I can say that? Because I didn't give them. It, it was awesome to hear from some of the men from within our fellowship give testimonies, give workshops, and some of the pastors from Coastline Navarre and Coastline Destin give teachings about this reality that the battle belongs to the Lord and great insight into our participation in that. And so this morning, as we have a little bit of margin, a little bit of time, I mean, last week we covered two chapters, which was phenomenal. We have some time this Sunday to ask this question, to camp on this thought, what's the enemy doing right now? What's that look like in our time? We see what's to come, that he's going to give an evil onslaught onto the world. The, the whole world at one point is going to be worshiping him. Jesus is going to bring that just judgment. But what about Sunday, October 23rd? Well, here's what we're going to look at today. Three simple things. Spiritual warfare is against the devil. Number two, Spiritual warfare requires a good fight. And then number three, spiritual warfare requires the right weapons. There's an enemy, there's a fight, and you're resourced. That's what we're looking at together this morning. You see, the enemy, the devil... He's spoken of there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I'll just read it to you. Paul writes this to these early Christians in the first century. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. You need to put that over the door frames of your children's bedrooms when you go in there. No, just teasing. <laughs> but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Paul writes to Christians, to you and I, to recognize this truth. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Where do we see that first? Genesis. Genesis. You know, in chapter 3, verse 15, God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is known in the Bible as the first mention, the first insight, the first glimpse that we have of a promise from God to send a Savior. You know the story from Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, where God creates everything, and the enemy deceives And because of that deception and choice of sin, the whole world is brought under the curse of sin and man is separated from God. Who had a part to play in that? The enemy, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes to these early Christians, we don't want to be ignorant of his designs, of his tactics. 
You see, the thing that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds is that there truly is an enemy. There is an enemy. Warren Wearsby says this, unless we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he can do, we will have a difficult time defeating him. He's a real person, a spiritual being who is originally one of God's most beautiful creatures. Many believe that he was the, the one who led the chorus of worship in heaven. We read in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, about his rebellion against God and his great fall. He, he's pictured in the third chapter of, Gen, of Genesis and in Revelation 12 as a serpent and as a dragon. Jesus called him a murderer and the father of all lies. Revelation 12 tells us that he's the constant accuser of the church, of the brethren. Second Corinthians, he's called the God of this age. First Peter 5, he's compared to a, a roaring lion. Second Corinthians 4 tells us his goal is to keep unbelievers blind to what God is doing. First Timothy 4 tells us that he's constantly promoting false doctrines. And he might even control Siri in the middle of a sermon. That's what just happened right there. But Satan tempted Eve in the garden. Adam followed and the whole world and all of humanity fell under the curse of sin. And a lot of people, you know, they think different things about the devil, about the enemy. That, that maybe he's not really like a, a personal being, but it's just a force. Or that he's equal to God if he is a being. Or that where he resides is in hell and he's the ruler of that place. And he can do whatever he pleases and that he's actually everywhere. But, but the Bible teaches something very different. The Bible teaches that he is a personal being with mind, will, and emotions. That he's a created being, not equal to God. That he doesn't rule hell, nor does he live there, but he was created. And that hell was a place created for punishment. And the Bible seems to describe, as you read even the book of Job, even the book of Revelation, how he has this access to both heaven and earth in this time. And that he's limited. He, he can only do what God allows him to do. And he is constantly, let me say this again, he is constantly working against the effect of God's word in our lives. That's why in 1 Peter 5, the church is encouraged, be alert, be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Anyone ever seen the movie City Slickers? You know who Norman is? The little baby calf that gets away and Billy Crystal almost dies in the river. This is back to 1991. It's like 30 years ago. But like, that's what the enemy, I want that one to get isolated, off track. I want to take him out. He says, be alert. Be sober. Pay attention. Not everything that you see in the physical is all that's really going on. There's a spiritual dynamic happening in life. Satan is not omnipresent. But you know what he is? He's organized. You know, there's a little book that came out years ago by a pastor of a Calvary chapel entitled Spiritual Warfare. And he, has, he says something here about this dynamic of the enemy. Though he's not everywhere, listen to how he operates. He says this, the Bible teaches that the devil is a real person, a spirit being who is originally God's most glorious creature, but by an act of rebellion has become God's arch enemy. And the Bible tells us that he's incredibly powerful, exceedingly intelligent, and immeasurably evil. Scripture also teaches that he's perpetually at war with God and his people. He's the commander in chief of multitudes of creatures similar to himself. And Paul refers to this army of evil creatures as principalities, powers, 
rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. All of these terms, this is the point, indicate an organized opposition. And he gives this analogy. He says, consider the Roman Empire. Caesar sat in Rome and made policy based upon his counsel with his Senate. Then the senators would pass the decision of counsel down to the governors and the rulers who would then implement those decisions. Likewise, within the kingdom of Satan, there are those high-ranking officials making policy and those low-ranking representatives implementing that policy. What's the point? We have an enemy who isn't sporadic or unorganized, but has a very meticulously organized evil arsenal. And often for many, there can be kind of, to be honest with you, two primary errors that happen when you're considering this dynamic of the enemy's engagement with his people. There can be this overemphasis or this underemphasis, right? Some blame every sin. Oh, Siri went off. That must be the devil. You know, and some blame everything, every conflict, every problem on demons that need to be cast out. Others, though, and I think this is the temptation of the world we live in now, others completely ignore the spiritual realm. And the fact that the Bible instructs us that our battle is actually against spiritual powers can be something that's lost on a world that every day is just seemingly becoming more and more self-sufficient, technologically advanced. See, the key is having a biblical understanding, finding that biblical balance. It's interesting, as you follow the life of Jesus, Sometimes Jesus would be walking down the street and he would cast out demons from others. Other times he would heal with no mention of a demonic presence. But it's important to recognize that the enemy is real. He's active. He's organized. And as a Christian, difficulty is to be expected. Let me say that again. As a Christian, difficulty might happen. As a Christian, as long as you give and serve, no difficulty to be expected in your life. As a Christian, difficulty is to be expected. Expected. I heard this quote this weekend and I thought it resonated well. It's from Charles Spurgeon. Being in the battle is actually a good sign because Satan never kicks a dead horse. Meaning... As a believer, expect to get kicked. Expect the opposition. It's like Peter told those early Christians, be alert, be sober-minded. You do have an enemy who's prowling around looking for someone to devour. You know, this author says this. He says, wouldn't it be nice if the Christian life was simply believing in Jesus and living happily ever after? But anyone who sought to seriously follow the Lord has found it to be otherwise. Jesus promised his followers that tribulation and opposition would mark life in this world. The primary source of that opposition is the devil and a multitude of wicked spirits who form a united front against the kingdom of God. There's an enemy. There's a fight. Jesus says this in John 16, these things I've spoken to you that you you may have peace in me. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. When Paul was writing to Timothy, let me read something to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You've heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these things to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, in the book of Revelation, we're given this insight 
We're given this insight that God loves his people. Remember that from chapters two and three, those letters that Jesus wrote to the early churches. Remember that revelation that John is given of Jesus sitting supremely in chapter one on the throne? Chapters four and five, where the people of God are with God in heaven, worshiping. And then we're given this insight that because God is a God of mercy and justice, there will come a time where the enemy is judged. That's right where we are in the midst of our study this fall. We're seeing how through this book that the enemy will throw every bit of his organized arsenal against God, against his people, against the world, and one day he will be judged. But today, on October 23rd, the enemy is still prowling around. He's still like that serpent who seeks to deceive and like a lion seeks to devour. That's the dynamic. That, that it's not about surrendering your life to Jesus and then everything should just start to fall into place. But there's this enemy who's not kicking a dead horse. He, he's going after those who are called and named as the people of God. So what should we recognize? Well, this is our second point. We should recognize that this requires a good fight. Again, like, like Timothy was charged in, in chapter one, verse 18 of 1 Timothy, Paul writes this, I charge, I entrust this to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies made about you. By them you may wage good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. The life of a believer, there is this dynamic that it's a battle, that it's a fight. You know, this weekend, Pastor Randy from Coastline Navarre, he made this statement. He said, as Christians, we're made alive in him and then we're thrust into battle. That's the dynamic. It's a battle against the flesh it's a battle against the world values, the culture we're in, the system for sure. But ultimately, it's against a battle of an enemy who is very real. And Pastor Randy went on to say this, and I thought it was so insightful. He said, he's not after our loved ones, our career, our health or our comfort. He's not really even after our freedom or our rights in this country, but something much more valuable. The enemy is after your relationship with Jesus. That's his target. Because out of that dynamic in the life of a believer is a wellspring of everything that God wants to do. A relationship with God that's personal, that's been bought because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. And listen to me. Let me see your eyes. Let me have your attention. That's what the enemy is seeking to destroy. Your connection, your fellowship, your relationship with God. Because if you've been walking through life for any bit of time, you begin to realize there's not so much power within me. There's not so much ability within me to control much of anything or to have any kind of effect or impact upon what the enemy wants to do. Because the battle belongs to who? The Lord. So what's the enemy's goal? What's his game? He wants your eyes off Jesus. See, he wants you to know doctrines about God instead of just delighting in God. Now, doctrines get you to that place and that framework where you can delight in God rightly. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But don't you realize that you can study, study, study this book and still not have a personal relationship with God? That, that's what Jesus would say to those religious elite Men that took, if we can put it in our language, church seriously. So much so that they were at every Bible study. They memorized. They, they, led, they led their lives according to the book that was given to them. And Jesus would say to them, you search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But these testify of me. It's a personal relationship with God that the enemy is after that he targets, that he wants to thwart, that he wants to get your eyes off of. So Paul tells Timothy, wage good warfare. God has sent his son so that you and I can have fellowship with him. 
Before he ever wants a worker or a warrior, he wants a worshiper. And it is only as you become a worshiper that you can work in warfare well. You get those backwards, you'll find very quickly that the enemy will be right there ready to prowl upon us who don't have it within us to work and to war against him. But see, our weapon's in God, and he's the mighty one. What the enemy would love to do, what he's after, what he attacks, is that intimacy and fellowship that God has bought for you because of what Jesus did on the cross. And here's the nature of this conflict. 2 Corinthians 10, we'll put it for you up on the screen. We're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud and obstacle that keeps, us, keeps people from, coming, from knowing God. We capture those rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That battle is in the mind. Those thoughts we bring into captivity to what the word says. See, our conflict is spiritual, but it can manifest in emotional or relational or physical ways. But like Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's an enemy who's organized. He has an arsenal. And he, he sends this collective attack for sure on all Christians. You know where you can see it? You, you can see it in Peppa Pig. Do you know what that is? Like, it seems like nowadays through entertainment, there's just like this collective onslaught of the enemy anywhere he can get a foothold to push an agenda that's anti-God. You see it everywhere. There's an enemy who has a general onslaught against the work of God, but there's also a personal attack, one that's intimate, one that's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Again, let me read this to you out of uh, what Pastor Brian Broderson says in this book, Spiritual Warfare, about the conflict that we're in. He says, the next thing we need to consider is the intimate nature of this conflict, indicated by this term, wrestle. He's referencing Ephesians 6 here. And there's two aspects, he says, to spiritual warfare here. There's the general sense in which the collective forces of God are battling the collective forces of Satan. It's intimate. It's personal. It's deadly. As a Christian, here's what he says that I want to share. You're being studied, stalked, and assaulted regularly. Those are like very instigating terms of description. You're being studied, you're being stalked, assaulted regularly. Failure to realize this can result in a casualty. And I like what he says. He says, maybe you're thinking, wait a minute, you're going a bit overboard. What do you mean? I'm being studied, I'm being stalked. You sound like a fanatic. Let me read something to you out of the book of Job. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 6 says this, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth. And the Lord said, Have you considered, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth blameless and upright, one who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and all the things on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, the possessions of increase in the land. By now stretch out your hand and, and then touch all that he has and surely he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person, his personal health yet. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. What does this indicate to us? That he knew Job by name. Knew the dynamics that were going on in his life. Saw God's hand of protection upon him. He was studied. And God 
as God is the one who is supreme, not the enemy, gave him this ability to tempt, to try, to test Job. And see, the tools and the tactics of the enemy, well, they're described there in Ephesians chapter 6 as fiery darts of the wicked one, wiles of the devil. Wiles of the devil, fiery darts. You see, these are the, the cunning, the crafty, the strategic attacks of the enemy. And the enemy targets your mind. How? What's his strategy? Lies. The enemy, he can target your body through suffering, your heart, through accusation, doubt, depression, and fear. And as it says here in Scripture, we're wrestling with these things. This isn't like a long-range combat situation. This is hand-to-hand. -hand. And the enemy's tactics, his tools, he uses condemnation. This thought that God could never use your life. This concept that God is against you, that he's not for you, that you failed one too many times for God's grace to still be extended to you. That's his tactic. That's his tool. He uses fear, doubt, depression, evil thoughts, temptation. I think one that is becoming more and more prevalent in this generation is imagination and speculation. That overthinking of things. But also bring temptation. The, the temptation of the flesh. Greed, lust, envy. You see, here are the two things I want to highlight for us at this point. Number one, there is an enemy. Number two, it requires a good fight. And then number three this morning, as we begin to close... The, the right weapons to fight, God, he gives us those things. Let, let me read to you Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Paul writes to Timothy, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, after all these things we've learned, that there's an enemy, that he's organized, that there's an arsenal, that this is going to require a good fight. Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Do you see this participation that he invites us into? Put on every piece of God's armor so that you may be able to just escape everything and get to that happy, clappy lifestyle. No. To endure. To endure. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. So stand your ground. And here are the pieces. Putting on the belt of truth. The breastplate of, arch of righteousness or the body armor of righteousness, as some translations say. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you can be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know, the battle that we face as believers, I love how Paul describes this to Timothy. He says, first and foremost, be strong in the Lord. Do you remember David, when David stood there before Goliath? Goliath is there with javelin, shield, and spear, towering over David. David was the cheese boy in his job description at this point in his life. Did you know that he showed up to the battle to bring cheese to his brothers? That's who he was. The cheese boy shows up. He sees this nine foot guy towering over the armies of Israel, spouting forth all these things against God and his people. And the cheese boy stands up and says, this battle belongs to God. It's in him that I'm going to fight. Give me six smooth stones and a sling and I'm going for it. 
David recognizes this reality that he did not want to go into battle in another person's strength. I mean, who's he going to go as? Here's the cheese boy. I'm coming for you. He comes in the name of the Lord. And what does Paul tell Timothy? Be strong in your resume. Be strong in your knowledge of everything that relates to... No. Be strong in the Lord. God, this is your fight. I'm coming in your name. Never go to battle in another's strength. But go in the name of the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Put on his armor. And so he lists these for us. The belt of truth. You know, the belt would hold everything up and everything together for that soldier in that time. I like what Warren Wearsby says here. He says, Satan is a liar. How many of you would agree with that? Amen. Satan is a liar. But the believer's life who is controlled by truth will defeat him. The belt held every other part of the armor together and truth is the integrating force in the life of a victorious Christian. A person of integrity with a clear conscience can face the enemy without fear. God, I know you. This battle is yours. And I'm walking with you in integrity. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness this is that piece of armor that covered the body from neck to waist, front and back. And it symbolizes one thing. Who makes us right? This is a pop quiz. Whose righteousness is this all about? Yeah, the Lord, Jesus Christ. That it's his righteousness in which we stand. Again, I'll quote Warren Wearsby on this point. I love what he says. It symbolizes the believer's righteousness in Christ as well as his righteous life in Christ. Meaning, positionally, know who you are. You're forgiven. You're made clean. Practically, live righteous. By the power of the Spirit, for sure. But make those choices. Live righteously. Wearsby goes on to say that our positional righteousness with, in Christ without our practical righteousness in daily life only gives opportunity for the enemy to attack. The sandals, he says, are the shoes of the gospel of peace. You know, one of the guys this weekend who was giving a workshop for our men and this, this focus, this theme of the battle belongs to the Lord. He said, everyone in the first century was a hippie, right? Everyone's wearing sandals. So the shoes that he's speaking of there, they're sandals. But think of them like sandal soccer cleats, you know? Like, like they had these nubs, these spikes in them, which gives them a firm and strong standing to be able to fight. And I like what he does here in this description of this piece of armor. Shoes take you places, right? Our business is to be about the gospel. That's what life's meant to be about. Standing firm in who we are, having a peace with God, knowing that he's made us right in his sight, that he's not against us. Like that should be a part of every day for us. But then also our comings and goings shouldn't be so much about us and the kingdom that we're seeking to build, but about the kingdom of God. That as we're going, our focus in life should be the good news of Jesus, not just making a buck, not just having the next trip or the next experience. But you want to fight and fight well, make your life about the good news of Jesus, but also stand in the truth of the gospel. I love that he says to put on truth, to put on righteousness, to put on peace. Put those things on and then to take up a shield. The shield of what, gang? What's, what's the shield? It's the shield of the shield of faith, the shield of faith. Now, this wasn't like a small like Captain America shield where it's like he could use it as a Frisbee. 
But this was two feet by four feet in size. And the edges were constructed in such a way that they could interlock together as soldiers. So that when an attack would come, they could take their shields, interlock them with one another, and then almost as one, go against what the enemy would bring against them. They would interlock together, fit together, and fight together, and block those darts of the enemy. And the faith that's mentioned here is not so much of the fact that, well, I'm a Christian, that's what should keep me. No, remember, it's not about getting saved and having a, a happy, clappy life, but it's about the trust in God with your day-to-day -day life. Remember 2 Corinthians 5? We walk by faith. This is the kind of faith where you trust God with your provision. You trust God with your kids. You trust God with your marriage. You trust God with your life. This is the kind of tool, this is the kind of piece of weaponry that quells and quenches those fiery darts. See, faith in many ways, like in that day as a shield would be, is a defensive weapon against that which the enemy brings. Trust God or worry, right? That seems to be the options there. When that health diagnosis comes, okay, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to trust you that this doesn't catch you by surprise. You may need to interlock your faith with another's to help you fight that battle. That's why there's fellowship. That's why we're together as a community. But the enemy shoots these arrows, these darts into our hearts and our minds Another thing that one of the speakers said this weekend that so I thought was put so well, he said, I wonder why it's fiery darts. Wouldn't an arrow do enough, you know? But think about it. When the fire hits a camp and it starts a blaze, starts a distraction, right? Where you feel like all you need to be doing in life is putting out fires and you're not focused on the fight that's in front of you. That sometimes that's what the enemy's just seeking to do, just to distract you, just to diffuse you, <laughs> just to make you feel like you're constantly having to put out fires. Take up the shield of faith and trust the Lord. Take up the helmet of salvation, a mind that's controlled by the reality that God is mighty and supreme and able to save. You've maybe heard me share this many times before, but I'll never forget the saying of one of my roommates in college. He would often say, Neil, isn't this amazing? No matter what happens today, we're still going to heaven. So that's a great mindset of every single day. Let me put that on. That no matter what happens today, no matter what comes our way, my path is still headed to heaven. And I think heaven needs to control our mindset. Because if it doesn't, your motivations for decisions may be very limited. Right? How you're processing what your next step should be. Is that decision being made in light of eternity or just what's right in front of us? And then he says, take up the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. It's interesting here. The, the word, the Greek word that he uses to describe the Bible here, the word, is not the familiar term logos, but rhema, which means more of a particular saying. This dynamic, like, like the author of Hebrews would say in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that God's word is living and active, as Paul would tell Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. Meaning that you know God's word in such a way that when the enemy comes, the word is in you and you're able to diffuse those lies with the truth of God's word. You know who gives a great example of that? There was this guy, his name's Jesus. And when he was tempted in the wilderness, every single onslaught of attack that the enemy would bring, Jesus spoke back to him scripture perfectly in defense of the lie, the temptation that the enemy would bring. You know God's word and you're able to use God's word to fight against the lies of the enemy. You see, one author put it this way. The better you know the word of God, the easier it will be for you to detect Satan's lies and reject his offers. There's an old song that we used to sing in Sunday school. 
and it even had like, I'd say hand motions, but it had, it had things you do to help you remember it. It would be like this. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. Anyone know that one? <laughs> one person in the back knows that. <laughs> well, I'm going to illustrate for you what we would have to do in Sunday school. We'd all get down like this, and we'd start to sing this song. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. <laughs> and then they would do this thing, and I don't necessarily remember the lyric, but if you don't read your Bible, don't pray every day, then you shrink, shrink, shrink. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this together. Let's stand together. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You're in church. People like you here. This is friendly. <laughs> uh, here's the lyric. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow. Now, if you say, man, I, I can, look, my knees, I'm not getting down. Uh, I'll let you use your hands, right? You can use your hands. But for those of us that still have the knees that work, let's start right down here. Ready? Read your Bible, pray every day, and you One more time. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you Amen. That's good. Have a seat. Have a seat. It sounds simple, but it is ever so true. And why do I share this with you? This is where we'll begin to wrap it up. Because what the enemy is after is your relationship with Jesus. That's ultimately what he's after. Does he want to destroy your marriage? Absolutely. Does he want to get you on a path of life of meaninglessness where you're just building kingdoms for this world? Totally. Secondary to the fact that if your heart is captivated by Jesus, then everything else is going to fall into place. Your perspective, your trust, what you're doing with your days, what shoes you're putting on. See, if you're in an intimate relationship with Jesus, that armor fits in place as it should. One author put it this way, and I'll put it for you up on the screen. In one sense, the whole armor of God is a picture of Jesus. Christ is the truth. He is our righteousness. He is our peace. His faithfulness makes possible our faith. He's our salvation, and he is the word of God. It's about Jesus. He goes on to say this means that when we trusted Christ, we received the armor once and for all. We put the armor on at the moment of salvation. That's that reminding of yourself of this is who I am. I am righteous in Christ, but there must be daily appropriation. You've got to read your Bible. You know, you've, there's got to be that. And I love what he says. When King David put off his armor and returned to his palace, he was in greater danger than when he was on the battlefield. We are never out of reach of Satan's devices, so we must never be without the whole armor of God. And I don't know how it all works other than this. There's this beautiful interplay that Jesus is all of this for us. Do we put on our own righteousness and that's how we're going to fight the enemy? Absolutely not. It's Jesus. But if we don't walk righteously, we're opening ourselves up to the enemy's attack. It's this beautiful interplay of knowing that we have everything we need in Jesus and also walk with him moment by moment. Does that make sense? Like that's how you fight. You recognize that this is him. This is the Lord's battle. I'm going to stand with the cheese boy and recognize that I'm going out in the name of the Lord. Not in the cheesy stuff I have. But also, I'm going to walk with the Lord today. I'm going to trust him. That's why he closes that Ephesians chapter 6 with this mindset on prayer. I'll read verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. That doesn't sound like I just threw my armor on and I'm good. There's this sense of supplication, watchfulness, perseverance. And all prayer is, is talking to God. What's the enemy after? That relationship. Relationships are built on communication. Talk to God. It's the greatest weapon we have. Pray for others. You've heard me say this many times before, but you know the 10 steps to happiness, right? Do something nice for someone else and then repeat that nine times. It's the same thing with prayer. 
If you're like, okay, man, I'm praying, Lord, I'm pr start praying for others. Pray. Prayer is powerful. Brian Broderson shares this. He says, the neglect of prayer is one of the main reasons for the weakness of many Christians, as well as the modern church as whole. Charles Spurgeon says this, my heart has no deeper conviction than this, that prayer is the most efficient spiritual agency in the universe next to the Holy Spirit. I could as soon think of living without eating or breathing as living without praying. And Paul gives this weapon. Doesn't it sound simple, church? The word of God in prayer. But as you stay in those consistently, as you know that this battle is a battle in the name of the Lord, not in our name, that's where victory is found. That's where the war is really happening. It's between the Lord and the enemy. And our opposition is real. Our conflict is personal. And a key to understanding spiritual warfare is to truly recognize that God is so much mightier and greater than our enemy. I mean, we've read, we're reading the end of the book, right? We know that the enemy will one day be judged. That God in his patient justice will one day bring to finality his wrath and just judgment. But that day is not yet today. There is still very much an active enemy in this time in the church age. And he seeks to deceive. He seeks to destroy his tactics, imagination and speculation, doubt and fear. He'll use temptations of the flesh, lust and envy, greed, pride. So we fight our battles by taking up, by putting on, putting on the peace that comes from the gospel, the truth of who we are because of God's word, the righteousness we have in Christ Jesus. And we walk with the Lord in obedience. You know, one author said, the armor of God is the eternal truth of God found in his word. And oftentimes to put on the armor is simply to apply the truth to your life. To walk with him. To allow him to be the one who gains the victory in a heart that's freshly surrendered to him. Spiritual warfare, it's against the devil, requires a good fight, and requires the right weapons. And those weapons should lead us to a mindset that the battle, that battle belongs to the Lord. I can trust in him and I can grow with him every single day as I'm reading his word, as I'm talking to him. And that's not all about me. I'm praying for others like it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And I'm letting the Lord fight my battles. You see, this morning, as I considered the fact that some of the guys from our fellowship would be in a weekend together, we're considering these topics fairly thoroughly. As we're looking in the book of Revelation, and we'll pick that study back up verse by verse next week, starting in chapter 17, we're seeing that the enemy's going to be judged. But how many of you would agree that he's still very alive and active today? Amen. That it requires a good fight. That we need to remember and realize that he's given us the right weapons. And we need that encouragement and perspective to stay sober, to stay vigilant, to stay aware. But also at the same time, to have confidence that our God, like we read or sang this morning, our God is greater, our God is mighty. He's higher than any other. He is the one who brings the ultimate victory. So can I have your attention? Can I see your eyes? Let me just encourage you this week to walk with him, to trust him. Distractions abound, right? But walk with him. Make that time to spend with him. Don't do it alone. Those shield of faith, like it would be an illustration for those Roman guards, their shields would interlock. Do life together. 
you know, this week in connect groups. Mo, if you'd like to poo in the back, you can put this slide up if you'd like. Um, we're going to give an opportunity for the connect groups to pray through the different pieces of spiritual armor. This was something we did in a directed fashion um, on one of the nights that we were together at the men's retreat. Uh, Rob Gilliard put together this phenomenal time for us where he kind of walked us through a directed time of praying through each piece of the armor. And he made this great point to, to make this dynamic something that's daily. And so this week as you're in community, as you're in a group, I want to encourage you, your group leader will have kind of the, those instructions for that. Such a meaningful and powerful thing to step into this daily. And my hope and prayer for all of us is as we continue to wage this warfare, we recognize that the battle doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. So let's stick and stay with Jesus every single day.